So well done. And I hope that those of you who were here last Sunday enjoyed listening to the songs of praise with birdies from Isla. Um, it was a lovely time. We, we were in a residence that had a huge number of trees, but also every branch was cluttered with birdies. So from the early morning to the late evening, the birds were singing their songs of praise. It was wonderful. Today, as you can see, is nationally known as Father's Day, and to that end I'm going to change the order of service very slightly, because when I think of Father's Day, I reflect upon the scriptures in Luke's Gospel. You may remember the familiar parable that Jesus spoke of, the parable of the prodigal son. Well, we might also call that the parable of the prodigal father because he was a great dad. Can you imagine having a son rushing off as Jesus said this boy did and getting in a total mess and turning around one day and deciding that the mess was no longer the right place to be. So he said, I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned in your sight. What did the father do? Push him away? No. The father wrapped his arms around him and welcomed him home. That to me is a beautiful picture of Father's Day. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer which is entitled Abba, Father, words that Jesus himself used. Okay? Please pray with me. Holy God, Thou who laid the foundation of the universe and set the worlds in motion, only You are holy. Your wisdom is beyond our comprehension and our language to describe You only reduces You to that which You are not. We praise You for the grandeur and mystery that is totally beyond our control. We thank you for the overwhelming smallness that we feel in your presence. Empower us with the awareness of our place in your scheme for life and help us to find joy in just being the people we are. On this Father's Day we are aware of the seeming contradiction of Jesus calling you Abba, Father. How can you be so indescribably other and yet so intimately connected to Jesus and him through us? Yet Jesus calls you the good parent who gives what we need when we but ask. Thank you for Jesus Christ in whom holiness and intimacy come together as one. May we dwell in Christ all of our days. Father, you know well how even with our best efforts and human relationship, 
relationships break down and cause pain. We confess that we have failed to trust you as a good parent and have been unable to provide healing parenting to the children in our lives. Help us to take care of our need to be parented before trying to nurture others. Give us the memory like that of the prodigal son, that we have a home with the Father who anxiously waits our return, despite our having grieved him and our rejection and for squandering our inheritance on things that cannot give life. So this morning we pray together for parents around the world who love their children, but they are unable to care for them as they had hoped. For parents who this morning are without work can worry about how they will provide for their family. Bless all who want for gainful employment and productive opportunities. And teach us that parenting is more than just putting food on the table. We pray for those who have been disabled in the service of our country, but now find they cannot serve family as they once had hoped. Comfort them, give to them a new vision of a useful, if limited, life that they now face. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very beginning <coughs> and the bearing witness of, with our spirit that we are children of God. And so we give you thanks and praise, our Father, as we bring our songs of praise and our worship and this holy sacrament be with us, I pray. Amen. So our opening hymn is Now thank we for our God. We sing together, we shall stand to sing.
having to ask you to give. Do you? I don't recall having ever asked you to bring an offering. Every Sunday that you bring your offering and bring it brought to the front, I'm so thankful because it's not the result of pleading. Does that make sense? It's the result of your generosity and your care for the congregation and the life of this church. So I want to say thank you before I thank the Lord. Okay? Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we give you thanks and praise for the way in which you provide for the needs of this congregation. We thank you for the faithfulness of those who give. And we thank you for the way in which the gifts are administered and used for your honour and glory. We give you a humble and hearty thanks and dedicate these gifts to you, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of confession and then we will follow that prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. A familiar prayer to those of you who have been worshipping for many years. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires and devices of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we have not, should have done, and there is no good in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared unto men in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to remain seated and we're going to sing together 485, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
those words in that penultimate verse of still small voice of calm. Before we listen to Lena re reading God's word, I just ask that we might still be still and experience that calm of which that hymn speaks. Thank you, Lena. Still small voice of calm. Father God, we thank you for your still small voice. May it be heard in the silence today. May we know that calmness of which you speak. Hear us now as we listen to Lena reading your word, listening with calm to your glory. Verses 1 to 18, giving to the needy. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. By others. Truly I tell you, you have received your reward, your reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your right hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Truly. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Or they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Surely I tell you, you have received your reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling with the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask them. This is how you should pray. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. When you fast, do not look sober as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. First Corinthians 11 verses 27 to 29. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a manner of the manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Amen. 
Thank you, Lena. We're going to sing together. We'll stand to sing number 662, Jesus, Thou Joy of Loving Arms. <laughs> sacrifice for us upon the cross. Grant that the words that I speak now and the words that we share together later will be honouring to you, our Father and our God. Amen. The theme of this message is real simple. You can see it on the screen. It's the Boy Scout motto, Be Prepared. How many of you can recall, if you have travelled, you recall going to an airport, you go through all the hassle of the security checks, you're taken and guided towards the place where you board, you join a long queue, but I wonder if you've ever walked towards the aircraft and noticed that before you ever got there, the pilots and the cabin staff were preparing the cabin and the aeroplane. You know, they don't just walk on and flick a switch and disappear along the runway. There's a lot of preparation, believe me. And I've watched the big Airbus, the Emirates Airbus, and it takes a long time for the crew to prepare that aircraft for their flight. Some of you have taken that flight, so you know what I mean. You know, I can think of lots of examples. Examples 
where we recall that we must do things right, but we first must prepare. I think of Hilda and the way she prepares for this service every week. It doesn't just happen. There's preparation involved. And then I watch Edith, not today, but next Sunday, we will watch Edith and others preparing the table for our refreshments. It doesn't just happen. And then I watched this morning with care as John prepared the bread and the wine for this service. And I bring this up because I think this is particularly true, this theme of being prepared when we come to this very special service of Holy Communion. You see, if you recall, the Old Testament priests went through extensive preparation to purify themselves before serving in God's temple. And I believe very humbly that we need to prepare ourselves before we partake of this feast. And Paul talks about this in his first letter to Corinth. You will recall in a reading these words from 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. What Paul is saying in this text is that we should never become so familiar that we just go through the motions. He's saying we mustn't make light of sharing this bread and cup. If we were to do that, it would be unworthy and it would be a sin. So before we partake, we must prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves properly. And the way we do that is by taking time, time to examine our hearts, our actions, our attitudes, and like the prodigal son, come to the point where we can say, I have sinned. Yes, I have. And Jesus died for our sins. And sharing the Lord's Supper is one way that we confess that we not only believe that Jesus died for us, but that each of us needed him. For this communion to have its full intended effect, to adequately prepare for this special supper, every single time we pass the plate and the cup, we need to stop and just think and admit the truth of these words. These words are, yes, it was for me that my Saviour died. Now, let's be open and vulnerable. In our day and generation, confessing sin is not a popular thing to do. Well, let's face it, we're not aware as we used to be of sin or aware as we should be. One seminary professor that I love wrote these words, I quote, The awareness of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin. They feared it. They fled from it. They grieved over it. Some of our grandparents agonised over their sins. A man who lost his temper might wonder whether he could still even go to Holy Communion. A woman who for years envied her more attractive and intelligent sister might worry that this sin threatened her very salvation. And so they would confess specific sins. But not anymore, for he writes where sin is concerned, People just 
mumble. No. That's very challenging, isn't it? And so before we prepare, let us do some reflecting and avoid the mumbling. Let's just look at what genuine confession really is. Now you know me well enough to know that before I preach to you, I have to preach to myself and I have done. We need to begin that process by asking God to show us our sins. We need his help because as fallen beings, our perceptions are impaired by sin, sometimes so that we can't even see the sin that it is. We need God's holy eyes in order to see our faults clearly. Listen to what David wrote in the psalm, Psalm 19. God discern my errors, forgive my hidden faults, search me and know my thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So one way we get God's help to determine our sin and see it as it is, is compare it to the standards in his holy word. For when we shine the light of his truth on our lives, that's when we see that we've strayed. Now please don't miss my point. I'm saying that without God's perspective, we're often blind to our sins. I don't know if any of you have had cataracts or cataract removed. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but I'll put my hand up because in 2015 I had both of mine done and I said to the elder on the back row, sitting roughly where Bill really is, I said, would you hold up four fingers, please? And he did, he held up, and I could see them. That's the first time I'd seen that clearly for quite a long time. Without confession, sin is like a cataract. It grows so that we're no longer able to see our own sinful attitudes and actions. We ignore, ignore injustice and human need for long stretches of time without any moral warning lights coming on in our heads. And if we're not careful, we can sin on autopilot without even knowing it. So genuine confession has to begin with our asking for God's help. And then in order to be motivated to confess our actions, we need to just ask two questions. Why and what was the result? Why did we sin? What motivated us to do what we did? We need to try and figure out why as John Ortberg, the great writer, Christian writer, says, this question is critical because sin is usually tied in some way or another to a need. And instead of sin being an attempt to meet a legitimate need, it is met in an illegitimate way. Why? And then secondly, what happened as the result of what I did or said who was hurt? Who was hurt by our lies, deception and gossip? What relationship suffered? Seeing the consequences of our sin helps us to see how bad it really is. It makes us to want to confess it and turn from it. Think of the way the prodigal son's father must have suffered. That was a consequence of the son's disobedience. And then as I inferred earlier, another part of confession is to confess our specific sins to God. Be specific. Because so many times our confession is generalised. When I write the orders of service and I write the prayers of confession, I try to remember this in my mind because for us to truly benefit from confession, 
If God is to bless us as we partake of this bread and wine, we need time to confess our specific sin to God. Otherwise, our hearts will not be in connection with him. John Wesley, he wrote this, he said, and I quote, as a very little dust will disorder a clock, and the least sand will obscure our sight, so the least grain of sin which is upon the heart will hinder its right motion towards God. Now I'm going to bring you the good news. When we confess, we are liberated from guilt. We realise that I'm finally being honest with God, I'm not playing games anymore, and I really want this thing out of my life. Secondly, we experience God's forgiving nature. I've tried many, many times to express what this really means. But God wipes the slate clean when we confess. And if you can allow me to quote Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then finally we'll be less likely to sin in the same way in the future. Because when we're honest with God, we can pray like this. God, give me your strength to forgive that and forsake that sin from here on out. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your promise that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Thank you for removing our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Thank you for your commitment to forget our faults and failures and to remember them no more. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for our forgiveness. Now as we share communion, Remind us that it was his sacrifice that makes it possible for us to be forgiven and stand pure in your eyes. And let that memory motivate us to turn away from sin. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So maintaining an attitude of prayer and confession, allow me to ask Billy and Colin, would you please come to the front? Thank you. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever has faith in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is the Lord's table, and our Saviour invites us to share the feast that he has prepared. Please would you turn to the person nearest to you with the words, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. So let us pray. Great and wonderful are your works, O God, the Creator of all. We thank you for your Son, your Son Jesus Christ, who lived our human life. He knew our joys and sorrows. He showed your love. 
He healed the sick. He was a friend to sinners. And in obedience to you, he took up his cross. And he died in love for us and all the world. You raised him from the dead to live and reign forever, a friend of sinners still. Therefore, with the angels and all people of faith of all times and places, we lift up our hearts in joyful praise, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit to bless us and these your gifts of bread and wine, that in communion with Christ our Lord we may receive his life and remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. And as we share in the body and blood of Christ, May we too become a living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we do this in obedience to Christ's example and command. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this. Cup, the covenant of Christ's blood shed for you. Drink all of it and remember him. This cup, the blood of Christ shed for you in the sins of many. Do this remembering him. Ask the elders to take the bread and the wine, and I invite you please to hold on to your bread and wine and we'll eat together. Okay?
So we take the bread and I will invite you to join together as I say the words of the institution. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this remembering him. cup. The cup you have in your hand represents the body, uh, the blood of Christ shed for you that the sins of yourself and many might be forgiven. Drink of this remembering him. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, let us pray. We praise you for your goodness to us at this your table, O Lord. You have fed us with the bread of life and made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have assured us in your word of your everlasting love. We pray this morning for the Church of Jesus Christ, especially for this congregation and parish, that many may believe in your love and live to give you glory. We pray for those who are in trouble, be it in body, mind or spirit, that they may know the comfort and the healing of your presence day by day. We pray this morning for our families, wherever they may be, and our friends, that they may be sure that there is nothing in death or life, nothing in the world that as it is or as it will be, nothing in all creation that can separate them and us from your love in Christ Jesus. Eternal God, we praise you for those who have made known your love and joy and who now rejoice with you in heaven. Bring us with them at the last to eat and drink to the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessings on each one of you. We now stand and sing together our closing hymn. It's well known, well familiar, but not too familiar that we should take it for granted. When I survey the wondrous cross, Isaac Watts, great hymn.
grace and peace of God which is beyond all understanding guard your hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus and the blessing of God Almighty Father Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever.